Welcome to the Personal Brand Era podcast. I'm your host, Ella Ray, and today I'm speaking with Margie Schenken Haddad, a parenting coach and author. She has been a global public relations expert for 30 years, who is now helping working moms. She's also the mother of three grown children. And this is the first time that public relations is being introduced as a way to parent. It's a new approach and a new way of thinking, which I absolutely love. And Margie is advocating to reverse the old philosophy to leave the job at the job. She says, bring your special professional skills to make you, you, home to help your kids to be the best selves. And the very first question that I would love to ask you, Margie, is what inspired you to become a parenting coach after being in PR for so long? And could you reveal to my audience what PR actually means? Well, the first question, how was I inspired to become a parenting coach? I'm not a parenting coach. I'm a PR parenting coach. <laughs> a little bit different here. Let me explain. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a parenting expert. I'm a public relations expert. I've been in the business for 30 years. And when I looked back, I understood that I had used my professional skills and expertise to raise my kids. That's where the concept of PR parenting comes in, taking two very unique professions, parenting, which is definitely a profession, and public relations, putting them together, kind of like chocolate and peanut butter or peanut butter and jelly, whichever you prefer. <laughs> and you get a really spectacular result. Now, how do I know that this PR parenting thing works? Because when I looked back and I thought about the choices that my kids made along the years. And I've got three kids, 26, 23, and 18. And when I watched them make their choices and choose their paths and problem solve along the way, I understood that they had used the public relations strategy skills and practices that they had learned at home in making these choices. And that was really kind of cool and the idea for this book the power of pr parenting wasn't even my idea it was my daughter's idea my older daughter like i said i've got three kids and she had said to me mom you made mistakes but overall you got it right and i think you should help the next generation of parents and particularly working moms in that particular conversation to benefit from your expertise and experience so that they can have an easier time parenting. So that's the short of it. I'm a PR parenting expert and that's how the concept was born. And I love that, that especially your daughter encouraged you to write the book. And I'm not really sure that all my audience knows what PR actually means. Could you walk us through the cornerstones of your profession and what are the main fields or things that you do? Sure. So PR means public relations. And what's kind of cool is that public relations is a common denominator for a lot of professions out there customer service, messaging, crisis management, strategic communication, strategy, mm. setting long-term goals and how are we going to achieve them? When I say messaging, I mean, what words, what tone, what delivery do we choose? to share our messages with the intended person so that the person is able to receive our information the way we intend them to receive it. When we are exercising these strategies, practices, and tactics in the journey of using them, we're able to build self-esteem, 
resilience, self-love, and in doing so, achieve success at every level, whether it's doing a great job, whether it's doing a better job, whether it's a big thing, or whether it's a little thing and everything in between, because success can be defined in all sorts of ways. So that's what public relations is as a general concept and, you know, the 500 feet above definition. And in the book, we drill down into all the specific details so that you know exactly what you're doing at the end of each chapter based on the concepts and their exercises in the book. So I'm going to show you what I did through personal and professional stories. And then it's your turn to do the same practices. We'll walk you through it. And then at the end of each chapter, Ella, there's a QR code that leads you to a workbook. <laughs> now that workbook is free because I wanted to give you a present and make sure that you all had something tangible in your hand. And that is an extended version of each of the exercises that you can do. You can either write them out and print out the paper or you could type them out and then print that out. But either way, whatever you choose, you have an action plan in your hand. So first read the book and then if you want, go ahead and do the exercises. So I have a lot of questions about the book and, and the whole process, but I will continue with um, this particular question. As I know you have structured your book in several uh, chapters, um, is it 10? Yes, ten. 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 Yeah. yeah, so, mm -hmm. and I would love to know which of the chapters did you enjoy writing about the most and why? Oh my, each chapter had its own unique theme, which were defined based on discussions with lots of moms of different age kids, because from the start I wanted to help. I didn't want to be random about it. And I asked them, what do you want to know? So they said, well, we want to know how to handle crisis management, whether it's health related or it's something in terms of bullying or some sort of violence on the street, prejudice. How do we encourage our children to be inclusive rather than exclusive? And how do you give up your pacifier? How do you get your kid to give up their pacifier without drama? How do you inspire confidence and resilience, things like that? So. I think, you know, because we go from light to really, really heavy and everything in between in the book, I think one of my favorite chapters talks about using rites of passage to build self-esteem, mm. to build confidence and resilience. And the reason why I really liked this chapter was because it was so much fun. And when I was writing it, I got to relive the experiences I had with my own children from the rite of passage is that we use at, at 12 and 13 in, in the Jewish faith, there's a thing called the bar and bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And I guess with every religion, you have some sort of rite of passage that's similar. And in this particular case, during the ceremony, there's a speech or a sermon. And that was a wonderful writing assignment and analysis assignment and presentation assignment. And then at the party that follows, there's always a party, right? So rather than hiring outside talent to come in, well, actually I didn't kind of a way, but my child was the center. They were the entertainment. So for example, my son uh, was the feature dancer with a break troupe, a break, um, a break dance troupe. And my older daughter gave a concert. And my youngest was trained to give a hip hop performance. And she was accompanied by two male backup dancers. And the reason why we chose the guys was so that we could incorporate lifts into her dance routine. Mm. So mm -hmm. in the center of this dinner hall where every, you know, circular tables and what have you, the kids performed. And 
it wasn't about being perfect. What the guests told us after the fact was as much as they enjoyed the performance, what really, really was electric was the enthusiasm our kids had and how much fun they were having. And the, the joy was just simply contagious. So they had this wonderful experience where they were able to increase their self-esteem, build their self-confidence, have fun doing something they had a passion for, and enjoy the journey. It was really a great experience. So I think that was a really fun chapter to write. And if I could, I would share videos, but <laughs> maybe for another time. <laughs> At some point, you can. I know you have a YouTube channel, right? You, you can share those uh, on your YouTube channel, right? I do. But here's the thing. Look, my kids all read the book before it was submitted mm. to the publisher. And they approved all of the content. And my older two wrote the foreword to the book, which, by the way, had nothing to do with it because it was the publisher's idea. I was kept out of the process and I didn't say it until after it was submitted. So the bottom line is, is that my kids have to approve whatever I post. <laughs> so we'll have to wait for their approval to let me go ahead and do that. And if they say yes, then I'll be glad to share because I'm really proud of the content. Well, I feel uh, it is really important for uh, kids to have a judgment-free space, so to speak, where they are not pressured into either direction that and especially that they don't have to make mistakes which i kind of see um across the globe if you will for many moms happening that they tend to direct or pressure their kids into either direction or into one specific direction that they want their kids to be great and not make mistakes from the get-go, right? And be Picassos and Mozarts and all that type of stuff. Specifically, I see that from moms that are well-educated, that are that have um, a degree in any kind of subject, right? So they have kind of a big expectation towards their kids. And I feel like even if you are a well-educated and well-rounded woman, you need to kind of get down to the level of the kids and make sure that you kind of develop them from their level up to a level that they choose to go, not you choose to go. And so I love that you have a similar approach to kind of give space, to have fun, to explore spaces that they might love and decide to maybe explore further and develop their skill. I had that very big success with, with my kids doing it, it that way and not any other way that I have uh, been taught to myself by my parents who uh, like applied a lot of pressure and expectation to how I was educated and how I had to do things. I chose to kind of give space and time and allow fun to be a big uh, like factor in it. and. I also love the fact that uh, you love music so much and that you try to incorporate music in your parenting and in your style and in your everyday life. Could you tell people more about that? Because I think music can make it so much more fun, not life just in general, but especially for kids when it comes to learning and to growing up and yeah. How many kids do you have and how old are they? I have two. Uh, my son is uh, 12 now and my daughter is seven. Oh, what great ages. Oh, good yeah. for you. So music. I love music. I was born loving music. I was born singing. My sisters and, and brother used to say, enough, stop singing. You're always singing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hear you know, I'm the type that's, that's, you know, standing in a department store and if I hear a good song, I'll start to dance in the department store. It really, you know, embarrasses my children, but there you have it. So from the early days, as soon as my kids were born, when they were babies, we used to dance in the living room to all types of music. And then when I would pick them up from the nursery school or kindergarten, we would have dance parties in the afternoon. Again, all types of music, and we would dance and hop around the room, and it was a really good time. 
And as they got older, when they started to take tests, I would use music on the way to the car, in the car ride on the way to school to chill out, clear their minds, have some fun and try to put them in a good mood before they would take the test. It's actually mm -hmm. a media training technique that I use until today. Before any of my clients begin their interview or when we're prepping, we always pick a favorite song and we jam out. It's one of my prerequisites for media training and for presentation training. Mm. This is and good. It makes, it makes an enormous difference in the, in, the, in the end product of both the interview as well as the presentation. And then, well, as I explained with the Bar Mitzvah ceremony celebrations, there was music in all three of their performances, whether they were dancing or singing. So all the kids have rhythm. They all dance light years better than me. They all sing light years better than me. <laughs> but, uh, or I should say, than I do. So yeah, music is a key component of our, of our lives. My daughter, uh, my older daughter still sings actually quite well. My son has actually been in the recording studio. He taught himself how to play the guitar and he writes music. Mm -hmm. And the the little one is still rocking out in the living room. <laughs> and does he plan to release his music also? What what kind of um, is his aspiration? After he finished the military, he rec a studio produced one of the songs that he had written, and he did post it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. He got a lot of favorable response. He is in university now and working for a high tech firm. He's a coder and he's getting a degree in computer science and, and statistics. So music is definitely a passion of his, but he also has the day job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so like future driven with uh, being uh, into IT and um, coding, this will be like really useful for him when I think about AI and all that stuff. Yes, and I, I should say that they all get their mathematical and scientific skills from their father. <laughs> I, I don't have a math gene in my body, but they have it and very and very strong. My daughter, uh, spoiler alert, is in medical school, and uh, the little one's thinking about being an anesthetic nurse. So mm. three, we brought up three scientists with musical talent. <laughs> That's the good news. This is like an amazing balance. Like I know a firefighter who has like, uh, he loves singing and like doing music just in general and playing guitar. And so he he's also showing that on, on social media, right? And uh, th that's so fun. That makes people so unique when they go after not only their, j their jobs, but also like develop a hobby that they really enjoy. And while music I'm sure made like the whole parenting easy. I'm sure you had like one or two situations that were really difficult for you, where even your uh, PR skills maybe drove you to the edge where you kind of didn't know how to solve that. Would you like to share with uh, the audience that are mostly moms and coaches, female coaches, um, how did you meet this difficult situation and what was kind of your approach on this difficult situation? Oh, Ella, there were lots of difficult situations. I've been PR parenting for 26 years. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Look, with any kind of difficult situation where you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing that. How on earth am I going to handle this? Mm -hmm. The key, the key PR practice that I exercised in every single case was in crisis management, we keep our calm, we identify the issue, what the core of the issue is. We assess the situation. We try to, as quickly as possible, determine a strategy to fix the situation, and then we execute. And that's pretty much what I did in any kind of challenging situation. I really just tried to keep my cool. Now, I didn't always keep my cool, you know, full disclosure. I'm not the perfect mother. Never said no I was. No one is. <laughs> no one is. Yeah. You know, 
made I made lots of mistakes and I'm still making them, though hopefully new ones. But see, that's what the book, that's part of what the book is about, so that y'all can mirror my successes and skip the hiccups and do it better than I did. Take a pick a page from my playbook to do it better than me. So that you can benefit from my hindsight and what I know now, which I wish I knew then. And you know it now. So key component. Number one, keeping my calm, trying to figure out really what's what's really the issue here when they're screaming at the top of their lungs. You know, I used to say to my kids, you've got two languages, pick one and tell me calmly what's on your mind. What do you need? And then we would problem solve from there. And I tried to do my best to help rather than to handle. Let's look at what we do with the office first. When we have a crisis situation at the office or with our customers or clients or bosses, we would never start screaming at them. Right. We would handle it calmly, try to problem solve, try to figure it out diplomatically. So why don't we do the same at home? Why don't we give the same respect to our children that we give at the office? Listen to what they're trying to tell us. Now, they may be screaming full volume, but what we need to do is zero in on the crux, the core of what they're trying to share with us. Remember, they're, they're little kids, so they don't have the same vocabulary yeah. or delivery maturity yet. They're doing the best that they can to share with you their messaging and to get your attention. Now, if you blow them off, they're just going to get more vocal. Just like a customer who's who's being handled rather than helped will mm -hmm. get more vocal. Yeah. So help your child. Don't handle them. Figure out what they're asking. Help them immediately or as soon as you can. And then watch them chill out and relax because they've been helped rather than handled. I think the reason why parents tend to do that, not, not only with their children, but just in general with their partners maybe as well, is because when we are at work, we are getting paid and we know exactly if we misbehave, we lose the job or we lose the client. So we don't give ourselves the permission to kind of go overboard or break boundaries where we exactly know there is a boundary but with the kids and with the partner many people tend to break the boundary because they know exactly and specifically for kids that the kids cannot leave you especially when they are very small and little they are so helpless they will not be able to leave you no matter what you do to them and this is uh, a big problem for for the kids right when when they have to experience such boundary breaking parents you know uh, that are not aware of their mistakes so i feel it is really important what you say is to like really learn to disconnect your own emotions in a way that you have in the moment and don't take care of your own emotions in that moment you have time to do that later on but take care of the emotions of the child in an adult way Correct. That's that's my opinion and based on my experience. Now, you made a very important point that the kids can't do anything about it right now, so parents may cross lines. But I have to tell you something, and I think that we can all agree on this because we've all experienced this because we were all little kids at one point too. But what our parents have said to us and how our parents have parented us has stayed with us until today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we might, we may not have been able to do anything when we were little, but we sure as heck can do something as adults. And remember, your children are going to be the ones taking care of you someday. So it yeah. better be nice to them because they're going to, they're going to choose your independent living someday. <laughs> but keeping in mind that what was said to us we keep with us what we say to our kids they keep with them and wouldn't it be nice if it was kind mm -hmm. and respectful so that they can pass that same kindness and respect onto their children because that's what they know think about it if you're helping rather than handling 
if you're being kind and not crossing lines, then not only does your child know that you're always a safe space, but their self-esteem will improve, their self-confidence will improve, their resilience will improve because they know they don't have to be perfect every time and it's okay to make mistakes. And when they become adults, they forward that on to their children and their children forward it on to their children. And then it becomes generational in the most positive way. And frankly speaking, that's the entire goal of the PR parenting movement, which this book is a tool for. The oh, idea is to that. create a situation where parents can learn communication based on public relations strategies, practices, tactics, so that they can implement them at home in such a way that the kids will carry it with them and pass it on for generations to come. Wouldn't that be nice to have a whole bunch of kids and their kids' kids, and then it becomes worldwide, and then kindness, respect, inclusion, celebrations of commonalities, as well as diversity? Wouldn't that make this world a better place to live in? I'd rather live there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it seems like um, like moms and dads need to write it on the mirrors that they have to behave like they are in public with their kids. Because oftentimes that's what, at least what I see is that parents act at home because they know no one sees how they are acting. And if they kind of imagine that somebody would see how they would react now to their kids, they would immediately be ashamed. And now for that not to happen, and I think this is especially very, very difficult for women, maybe specifically, to handle when the kids are very small, very little. And I know you take care of uh, a whole range of kids from like the newborn to the teens, right, to, to the adult uh, ages. And would you say that you apply the same strategies to all ages and even boys and girls the same way? Or do you have developed kind of different approaches to, let's say, a three-year-old compared to a 16-year-old? And maybe a girl differently or slightly differently to a boy. And I'm sure that your culture, and I know you are, are you in Israel, right? Israel and American, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, your husband, I think, is uh, from from your last name, Hadad, is is an Arabic name. So I assume you have an Arabic speaking husband. And like cultures are so different in the approach of how they parent and how they raise kids, right? Um, even boys and girls and kind of the difference. I would love to know the, the fine details uh, of that. My husband is Israeli born. And his mother is from Morocco, and his father is from Tunis. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Eastern culture. I was born and raised in the United States, and I moved to Israel in 95. And I have that culture. I have two girls. I have one boy. Now, if we look at this from a public relations through a public relations lens. Let's answer your question. Whenever we start a project and through the course of that project, the first question we ask ourselves, other than what are our short, medium, and long-term goals, the big question is, who's the target market? Who are we sharing our message with? And then we create our key messages for each of those target markets. We craft the key messages for each of those target markets. So if we bring this on home and knowing that every child is different, <laughs> every, and none of them come with instructions. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, oh no. And they're all different boy, girl, what have you, two girls are completely different, the son is completely different. Whenever we share the messages, we have to consider our one person target market and think, if I want to share a message and achieve this goal that I'm interested in, 
how do I need to deliver my message in order for this to occur or for them to understand it in a kind way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the answer to your question is yes, same, same, different, different, same strategy, different application, depending on who it was and where we were in their evolution. We always had boundaries. There were always curfews for all of them. There were certain things that were allowed and certain things that were not allowed, period. And I know it's really tough moms out there to hold your ground. In fact, it's exhausting. And I'll be the first one to tell you, it's exhausting. But you have to take a deep breath, dig your stiletto heels in or your sneakers in. At this point, I'm in sneakers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> wheels I tossed a long time ago uh only on special you know black tie occasions now and you know maintain those boundaries it's really really important but in a kind and firm way as as best as you can you know when the kids would rebel in any kind of way they would say I want to go here may I go and we would say no for one reason or the other. And they would say, why? And I'd say, yeah, I don't have to tell you why, that's the answer. And then they would storm out and then they'd come back again and they would say, well, I need to know why. And then I would say, well, tell me, why is this so important to you? And then they would lobby. Now, this was really awesome that they would lobby, even though it was in the heat of a discussion and a rebellion. Why? Because here they're advocating for themselves. They're practicing advocating to, for themselves in clear communication. And sometimes they did it in Hebrew in our house. And sometimes they would do it in English. But what was great, again, is that they were advocating for themselves. What a, a wonderful exercise in debate, in lobbying, in communication, in language, in sharing your key messages to get from one place to another. And sometimes, quite frankly, Ella, they lobbied so well <laughs> that I caved and I let them go. Oh. If it had to do with if it had to do with their safety, it didn't matter what they said. The answer was no. Mm. But if if it was just because I was, you know, I just didn't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, because it had been a long day and I didn't want to have to stay up late to wait for them because I would always wait till after the last person came home and locked the door before I would go to sleep. That's just the way I am. If they had a really, really good explanation, they lobbied well, they articulated well, they presented their case well. All right, go ahead. It all depended. So yeah, different, different messaging, different kids, different target markets, different end goals. And then the situation gets flipped around and they have to do it with us. And it's a wonderful, wonderful exercise because if they can lobby so beautifully when they're angry and they want to achieve a goal with you, imagine how far they'll take that in real life because they had all this practice at home. I think this is really important what you're mentioning. Um, for a person to be like a fully functional person or for a kid to be a fully functional person in the future, we need to teach them a couple of things. And you mentioned emotional stability and you are a role model in that. Whatever you show them, however you show up, in front of them will be the thing that they will copy right so first of all you need to manage your emotions yourself before you expect them to be really good at it right and if you can't manage your own emotions then you are just exploding at any difficulty or, or whatever you cannot really expect your child to be better than you right you, you have to kind of teach actually, them actually with we hope, we hope that they will be. <laughs> we hope that they're better we versions hope, of yeah. us. 
And another thing that you mentioned also is the communication skills. And I love that. I love that you are uh, specifically teaching that and that you're also advocating writing skills, uh, which uh, are, I think will never go out of fashion. And no matter how good AI will become, we will still need to be very good communicators if we want to build relationships and everything that we do in life is based on relationships how good we manage our emotions how good we are able to communicate with another person based on their level right and not just talking down to them right you talk a lot about that as well to to not be to not talk to the children from above but really finding their level which i found is a very successful technique to do that because they will feel as if you know them, as if you are interested in them, genuinely, if you talk eye to eye to them and not from above. And even if you do that from a physical standpoint of view, you go down on your knees if the child is still small, you know, and you are looking directly in their eyes. It makes so such a big difference in the most difficult situation and that you also advocate uh, the communication skills that I mentioned and the writing skills. Could you tell me more about how much will people read about that in the book? And why is it read all- important from, from your standpoint of view? Why is it so important to have writing skills, communication skills? Well, there are actually a couple of topics you just mentioned. Let's start with the first, which is communicating with your child and not talking down to them. Because I spoke to my children in in plain language and did not talk baby talk with them, Mm -hmm. their vocabulary improved immediately. They had a sophisticated vocabulary from a young age. They're all voracious readers. That's another thing. And the other thing that built their vocabulary, going back to that point of advocating themselves during an argument when they wanted to go out and I would say no, they would lobby, lobby, lobby. I also use that as an opportunity to correct their English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> every every opportunity is an, every extra, every interaction is an opportunity to improve language skills, whether it's writing or whether it's verbal. Now, why is writing so important? Because in all of our world, when we communicate today, it's emails, it's applications, it's text messages, it's PowerPoint presentations. We need to have a grasp on how to put a sentence together, how to share our messaging so that we're understood in a way that we intend to be understood in order to achieve our goals, hopefully. So writing is really, really important. And we can start as early as the first grade with the writing assignments and learning how to advocate and practicing our handwriting and practicing sentence construction and doing so with the traditional rite of passage that we're all familiar with and to get our kids going early on this and then to continue you know all the way up into adulthood and i think that you may have heard this story before but it's the tooth fairy story have you heard this one before I'm not sure, but my listeners, I'm sure have not. So I would love for you to share it. Okay. So moms, when the kids are around six years old or first grade, two things happen. Number one, biologically, they start to lose their teeth. Number two, in school, they start to learn sentence construction. So what if we put the two of those together and recruited the tooth fairy to be our partner in this exercise. And we invited our child to write a letter to the tooth fairy. So rather than just putting the tooth underneath the pillow and getting the money, which we're all used to, accustomed to, that's the tradition, we have our child write a letter, a request letter. Dear tooth fairy, my name is Susie. Now I know that you have a lot of children to visit tonight, but I lost my tooth too. And if you have some time, I'd be very happy to have $6 because I understand that that's the going right now. (laughs) And if you don't have $6, then I would love to have a chocolate bar because mom told me that 
That's the best candy because it washes off your teeth. Love, Susie. Something like that. Now, as the parent, invite them to write the letter. Help them to construct the letter. Help them with their spelling. Help them with whatever they ask you. But they're in control. It's their letter. Now, after they finish writing the letter, say, what a fabulous first draft. Mm -hmm. How about if I show you, tell me what you think, but I'm going to show you how to make it even more fabulous. Would you be up for that? Well, of course, because it's for the tooth fairy. And who doesn't want to take something that's fabulous and make it more fabulous? By doing it this way, we're showing them that they've done a great job, that it's okay to make mistakes, and that we're just going to give feedback, not criticism. Now, when we do this, we, we show them the changes that we would like to suggest. It's not a dictatorship, it's a suggestion, so it's up to them. But we show them in pastel pretty colors rather than in typical fire engine angry red. <laughs> and as you're making your changes at the end of the edit, you have a very pretty document as opposed to something offensive all marked up in red. So you can accept this as feedback and welcomed feedback. Now, the next step is to say, this has been wonderful. Now let's make this beautifully colored letter into one color of your choice and please rewrite it so that it's clean for the tooth fairy. So round two, and then the child writes it over again, which is more practice with handwriting. And when you're writing the same document over, you're reviewing your messages again. So maybe your child will want to change it up to them. Again, they're in control. And then at the very end of it, they have a clean document. That's what they put the tooth in. And you put that into an envelope. They write tooth fairy on the envelope and slide that under the pillow. And that's what they get the reward for. So they've practiced their handwriting. They've practiced messaging. They've practiced sentence construction. They've practiced advocating for themselves to go from point A to point B to achieve a goal. All in this very simple and fun letter assignment. And this also teaches them that mommy is there. She's safe. She's going to give me feedback, not criticism. She loves what I do, and she's just going to help me make it better. And that strengthens an already strong bond between you and your child. That is the Tooth Fairy story. What I specifically love about this story is uh, that you have a very playful approach because losing the teeth, and I don't know if my listeners ever would remember that time, um, is quite painful for kids like they they get scared what is happening with me am I, am, I, am I falling apart and am I going to ever have teeth again and stuff like that so it, it makes all kinds of like all kinds of emotions are coming up right and if you turn it actually into a playful thing into something that uh, will have a positive outcome for them to get, get a gift or anything, right? And to directly communicate with the tooth fairy, which they believe in at six years old. Like you, can, you take all that fear and pressure and uh, feeling of unsure, um, insecurity in some way, and also takes away the... Uh, the focus uh, of their like outer space, if you will, right? Uh, the the appearance that they have. People, kids sometimes do start to worry at that age how they will look without the teeth and stuff. And I think for girls even more than for boys. And so you take away that focus from their appearance and you turn the focus on something else that they might enjoy communicating with the tooth fairy. And I love what you said at the end it creates a deeper bond with your child and in the end this is like the memories that you literally create with your kids 
and not all memories will be beautiful but when you take something that is stressful for them and you turn it into something beautiful like how much are they going to remember that like all their lives what kind of a spirit and soul you have been as a mother what kind of a space you mentioned that before what kind of a safe space you have created for them for them to thrive in and become better than they have ever been and i love that approach very much what's fun is that you can do this with every single tooth that falls out of their mouth mm -hmm. <laughs> you have lots and lots of time to practice together yeah. in a fun way and long after they know that you were not the tooth fairy <laughs> yeah it just became a tradition in our house and what's kind of fun is that a trust is developed so that if you have this experience with the tooth fairy letters then they feel comfortable sharing their other work with you along the way too and want to get your opinion because they know that the feedback will be helpful you're going to tell them what to do not dwell on what not to do or what they needed to change but more about how to fix it and the mm -hmm. positive and how to improve and going forward and then that's something that they'll take with them into adulthood and they'll want to share with you mom would you mind taking a look at this for me i have a, a school presentation and i could use a second pair of eyes and this is something that i say very frequently which is there's no such thing as a perfect first draft and that's also something that we see in adulthood in our professions especially in pr with press releases and all sorts of different documents that we create in in the business there's no such thing as a perfect first draft i'll say it again not for us and not for the kids and we can't have them thinking that it's not okay to make mistakes on your perfect first draft and so this tooth fairy exercise is a way of doing that so that they can build confidence resilience self-esteem and ultimately they achieve success because they have that letter at the end of the exercise and yes they're going to get the prize so ding you know yay yeah like a lot of check boxes are going to be checked off this is the kind of thing that we go through in the book there's a ton of different exercises and we address them like we said from very very early on up until pretty much adulthood and if somebody wants additional support ella they would like a little bit of coaching and maybe in a small intimate private community then i would invite the moms out there that is something they are also looking for we're starting a pr parenting program on may 24th and you can go to my web portal that's where the application is to apply we're going to have 10 spots available i want to keep it small so that i can be available to everybody as much as possible and we can workshop if you're having an issue or a challenge that you would like to try pr parenting to solve or maybe you've got things covered but you'd like a new approach a new way of looking at things a new fun way to approach something that you've been handling all these years you know just like the presentation or the performance or things like that i've been party planning for 30 years we can walk you through party planning exercises for everything from a kid birthday party to spaghetti night to some major thing that you might be working on because i've produced media breakfast and press conferences for world leaders the bottom line is i'm available to help through this program or through private coaching and if anybody wants a little bit of extra deep dive into the strategies i'm happy to help i'm really loving this uh, especially uh, the extra help that they can get from this program uh, beside the book and i think you also have the the workbook right that comes mm -hmm. with the book that people can get and when is your book being released the book is released april 4th mm -hmm. the workshop the program starts may 24th okay so people have enough time to read the book go through the workbook and then maybe book into the program if they need further help and support and for my listeners i will leave all the links to margie's program and the book in the description so that you can 
go ahead and uh, go through that and get her book. And I really love this conversation and I have a million more questions for you. Uh, but I'm really happy to invite you again to my podcast to maybe get, go over the other questions that I have. But for now, I am thanking you for your time and for your expertise and insight into this very, more, uh, very much important uh, topic that my clients go through on a daily basis. And I hope some of my listeners got a little bit of value from this. Go ahead and uh, get Margie's book. Um, this will be eye-opening for you if you have been struggling with uh, with little kids, with teen kids, you know, um, that they are stressing out and giving you headaches. And, you know, <laughs> this will give you a new pair of eyes, a new perspective on how you can actually manage yourself, manage your kids in, in the most kind way and really build a beautiful a connection, a deep connection with your children. Thank you so much, Margie, for your time. And I wish you all the best. And I cannot wait to have you again on my podcast. Oh, it would be my pleasure. There's been a lot of fun sending love to all the moms out there and to you. You all are doing a great job. But if you need any help, we can, you know, have a, a look at a new way of looking things, a new approach that might help make the journey a little bit easier. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.